The famed romance that height the rose behold, Love's art its leaves enclose. Full many a man hath cried amain That dreams and visions are but vain imaginings and lies, But I believe that they may truthfully forecast the future, And full clear and plain this matter doth appear By that famed dream of Scipio, Whereof Macrobius long ago the story wrote, And stoutly he affirmeth dreams for verity. Moreover, if one think or say that fond and foolish tis to pay respect to visions, seeing that ne'er they prove them true, that man may dare to call me fool. For I avow that I dim night-tide's warnings trow sincerely, and believe that they, of good and ill, to men betray the shadow, showing darkly all that shall in day's clear light befall. T'was in my twentieth year of age, when love doth all young hearts engage to pay him toll, that on my bed I lay one night as custom led asleep, when o'er my spirit fell a wondrous pleasant dream that well delighted me, and naught therein I saw but what did later win fulfilment, and I now in rhyme set forth the tale to while your time and glad young hearts by love's command, and should or swain or maid demand how that is called which now I write, I answer the romance it height for lovers written of the rose, which doth love's gentle art enclose. Good is the matter, fair and true. God grant that grace it find in view of her for whose behoof was writ. Worthy of love is she, and fit before all other maids, I swear, the fragrant name of Rose to bear. Five years have rolled their sons away since in the amorous month of May I dreamed this dream. O oh, month of joy that knows all nature to decoy to mirth and pleasure. Bush and brake alike their fresh spring raiment take of leaves that long in swaddlings lay, close shrouded from the light of day, while woods and thickets don their green rich mantling of resplendent sheen. Then earth, though old, once more grows vain, and cheered by balmy dews and rain, forgets her poverished drear estate neath winter stern and obdurate, for pride awaketh new desire to dizzen her in bright attire, and thereto doth she fashion quaint and fair habiliments, and paint them o'er with tints of varying hue, green herb and flowers, white, red and blue, and tricked in such gay robes I ween old earth loves dearly to be seen, the merry birds that silence kept while all the world neath winter slept, and wild winds roared and skies were grey with rain, break forth when cometh May in lusty note, and let sweet song proclaim their joy that winter's wrong is past, and now once more doth rain sweet springtide o'er old earth's domain. Then nightingales with newborn voice through day and night make dulcet noise while larks on high and in the break the wood whales heavenly music wake. And hearkening such sweet clamour, soon young hearts respond the amorous tune in this sweet season of fair spring. O oh, dull the soul that caroling of birds delighteth not when they the echoes wake in joyous May. T'was in this season of delight when all things love as if of right that lying on my bed I dreamed dull night was past and dawning beamed, and leaping from the couch my face I washed in haste, the night to chase, put on my shoes, then straightway took a silver bodkin from a book or bodkin case, and with a thread engarnished it, then forthwith sped from out the town, with will to hear the woodland fowl with piping clear give welcome to the season new, and as I went the cords I drew, basting my sleeves, all joyous I to hear the birds sing merrily among the springtide's burgeoning trees, moved gently by the fragrant breeze. So to a river came I near, whose pleasant murmur struck mine ear, and soothing past all words did seem the rippling music of the stream. From out a moss-grown rocky bank in bubbling waves that rose and sank with changing force, the water cool fell clear and bright, until a pool it formed, meandering o'er the plain in volume less than rolls the Seine, but broader spreading as I ween. Never the eye of man hath seen a fairer sight than that which I now gazed upon so rapturously. A while I stood, then in the wave, glistening and fresh, I stooped to lave my face, and saw the river bed with smooth bright gravel stones bespread, and all around the meadows wide were freshened by the lapping tide. Calm and serene and bright and sweet was that spring morning, as my feet along the river bank I bent, light-hearted, heedless where I went, and hearkening as it rolled along the stream's unending murmur song. The lover here essays to draw the wondrous counterfeits he saw painted along the garden wall. Before our eyes doth he recall lifelike the semblance, form and fame of each, 
and tells thereof the name, and first with lively pen, portrays of hate the direful works and ways. Short space my feet had traversed, ere a garden spied I, great and fair, the which a castled wall hemmed round, and pictured thereupon I found full many a figure, rich and bright of colour, and how each one height clear writ beneath it. Now will I to you declare from memory the semblance and the name of each, and somewhat of their natures teach. Amidmost stood Hell's daughter Hate, malignant, base, and desolate of countenance, prime mover she of quarrel, strife, and jealousy. Her very being as meseemed with black and treacherous poison teemed of evil passion, while her dark and frowning visage bore the mark of frenzied madness. Heavenward rose as if in scorn her camus nose, and round her head, as if with will to make her foulness fouler still, a filthy clout had she enwrapped. Felony. Left of her stood a figure capped and branded with a legend writ full large, which well her face did fit, it said, Behold foul felony. Villainy. And on her right hand villainy stood pictured, and I soothly wot that twixt this evil pair is not disparity of one poor hair. A creature looked she born to bear within her bosom rancorous pride, her mouth thin-lipped as formed to chide. A master t'was whose pencil drew these portraitures, and thoroughly knew his hand this face and form to dight, as one who little recked of right, a woman who would scorn to do honour to those to whom t'was due. Covetousness Next her was painted covetese, who eggs men on for their misease, to gather but to scatter not, and store when not they need God what. She tis the usurer doth cause to press, unstayed by pity's laws, for gain relentlessly. Tis she doth urge to deeds of felony poor thieves who, when they fall beneath the hand of justice, find swift death. Tis she that causeth men to take their neighbour's goods, and doth awake desire to rob, deceive, and steal. And tis through her that tricksters feel impelled to fraud. Tis she doth make false pleaders who, for lucre's sake, full many an innocent youth or maid strip bare by their unholy trade of patrimony. Crooked and bent her fingers grew as they were meant by nature all to grip and seize that came anigh her. Covetees care for naught except to get her neighbour's goods within her net. Avarice. Another image close allied to Covetees stood side by side with her. T'was Avarice, and she looked foul and stooped most wretchedly. Her wasted figure, lean and weak, was wan and pale as garden leek, the while her visage, void of blood, bespoke her languorous wearyhood. Her corpse-like body looked as fed on crusts of sour and mouldy bread, kneaded with leaven thin and eager, and with intent to hide her meagre shrunken limbs, she o'er them cast a tattered threadbare garment, past all hope of mendment, torn and slit, as though fierce dogs had worried it. In such poor wretched rags was she arrayed, God what right beggarly! Hard by upon a crazy pin was hung her cloak, outworn and thin, wrought of good brunette cloth, once fair and soft but now of ermine bare, and in the place of costly fur poor avarice contented her with heavy lambskin, shag and black, full twenty years her skinny back hath borne its cumbrous weight, for shy as avarice new clothes to buy, but findeth ever some excuse to spare her clouts due wear and use, and where outworn her soul doth rue sorely the cost to purchase new, but grievously the pinch of cold will suffer ere she spends her gold. With greedy clutch doth avarice hide her purse, which ne'er she openeth wide, but keeps the strings drawn close and tight, consumed with jealous fear lest light her coin should see. Alas, but small delight doth hence to her befall, for ne'er from out that purse would she spend one poor penny willingly. Envy. Beside her sad-eyed envy stood who smileth never. Nothing good to her doth seem, and nothing can cheer her soul to joy or please her ear, except it be some evil hap befalls, the happiness to sap of worthy men, that only she heareth or looks on joyfully. But if perchance some lineage great cast down should be from fair estate, above all else such case I deem would raise her soul to joy supreme. Should some good man perchance arise to honour great, within her dies her heart, but marvellous delight awakes therein when hate and spite spur men to wrath. 
Such rancor grows within her breast that ne'er she shows love to a friend, nor hath one good kind thought towards those who share her blood. Yea, sorely twould her heart distress her sire to see in happiness. Right cruel is the price she pays who walketh thus in devious ways, and through her cursed spirit she suffers forsooth most bitterly. For in her villain mind doth rage torment more rude than thought can gauge, when e'er she hears of kindly deed or worthy act, and sore doth bleed her venomous heart enduring this, which God's most righteous vengeance is upon her. Envy's evil tongue spares no man, be he old or young. And if twas hers to know perchance the noblest knight who honours France, or one whose fame lies over sea, she'd deal them slander equally. And should their names so fair be found as make her villain words redound to eke their praise, then would she try by mean insinuating lie to undermine their fame some deal with venomous wound no balm could heal. I noted how she seemed to glance sideways with tortuous peep askance, and furtive leer turned all awry, half closed her slanting evil eye. Her habit seemed forsooth innate that she towards no man cast a straight and honest gaze, but one eye closed she kept as if forsooth she dozed. Then suddenly twas lit with ire if some fair thing she saw, and fire would burn therein, for she loves not aught good or beauteous, as I wot. Sorrow. Then standing envy close beside was fretful sorrow, heavy-eyed and dismal. By her deadly hue twas clear her wretched spirit knew unending grief, and thus jaundice paled all her blood. E'en avarice than she doth look less poor and lean, for care and misery well I ween, and cruel chagrin and distress that day or night no never cess she suffers, and through sickly woe more lean and pale doth daily grow. None suffereth martyrdom more dire than she, and this begetteth ire within her heart as seemed to me, and much I doubt if aught could be or said or done whereby to ease her rooted grief, or calm or please her cankered soul, or break the round of care wherein her life is bound. Alike her face and garments wore marks of the cruel rage that tore her woeful heart. Her nails had scratched her cheeks the while her hands had snatched her robe to rags, and plainly spake what cruel passion was awake within her miserable breast, outworn with rage with grief oppressed, sad token both of spleen and hate that left her thus disconsolate. Around her head hung ragged shocks of hair in wild disordered locks, the which her angry hands had torn, the while she wept her state forlorn, till every eye that saw her grew bedewed with tears of pitying rue, for ceased she not to beat her breast as though with madness dire possessed. Her body and soul both seemed to be encompassed round with misery. No pastime sought she, and the bliss her mouth ne'er knew of amorous kiss. The white whose being is in woe immersed hath little will to go where merry folk dance, laugh and sing, but closely hugs her sorrowing, for joy and sorrow know not how to dwell in fellowship, I trow. Eld To sorrow next was pictured Eld. Time's hand all care for food had quelled within her, and a foot was she less than in youth she woned to be, bowed down by toil and dreary head. Her beauty years long past had fled, and foul of face was she become. And though old time had left her some sparse straggling locks, her head was white, as though twere flowered, the loss were light if that poor body worn and waste, the doubtful woe of death should taste, for shriveled were her limbs and dry. Faded her once bright lustrous eye, wrinkled the cheeks once soft and smooth, and those once pink shell ears forsooth now pendant hung. Her pearl-like teeth, alas, had long since left their sheath, and barely could she walk as much as fathoms four without her crutch. Time speedeth over night and day, no rest he taketh, nor delay of briefest movement makes, but steals so wearily along, man feels his going not, but fondly deems time standeth still. But while he dreams half waked, time's foot hath passed, I trow, for none can say that time is now. Ask thee some learned clerk, while he maketh response, the time shall be gone and departed three times o'er, for time I passeth, but no more returneth. E'en as water flows for ever onward, but ne'er goes back to its source. No thing can dure against the force of time, though sure as adamant or iron. Time each thing devoureth when its prime is reached. Tis time that maketh grow all newborn things, 
and time doth show how all things change and wear and waste. Tis he that hath our fathers chased from off the earth. Of mighty kings and emperors the dirge he sings, and all through time must pass away, for he tis marks our dooming day. And time, who ne'er forgotteth aught, hath eld forgotten not, but brought his hand to bear upon her so that feebler doth she surely grow from day to day, until no more she hath of strength or notes of lore than child that on its mother's knee or laughs or smiles unconsciously. Yet nathless had eld been in youth a damsel fair and sweet forsooth to my sure knowledge, but I trow is sadly metamorphosed now, changed to a world-worn doting thing. A great fur cloak for wrappering she wore, methinks around her form I see it yet to keep her warm, for aged folk still dread the cold by nature's law through many a fold. Hypocrisy. The image standing next was fit to show right well a hypocrite. Pope Holy was the name she bore, and on her face a mask she wore of righteousness, for her great care is to take men unaware and play them some base shameful trick. On first acquaintance is she quick to waken pity by her sad and simple piteous look, be clad with simple sweet and saintly seeming. But in this world no evil deeming exists that rolls not through her brain. The painting gave to her a main kind gentle semblance, debonair and simple all her features were, and both her pose and raiment done in guise of some good convent nun. A psalter held she in her hand, as though the throne of God she fanned with holy prayers and saints invoked. But never laughed she, smiled nor joked. Good works pretendeth she to do, as though naught else did she pursue since first she donned the shirt of hair. Her wretched body, lean and spare, all bloodless looked and deadly white, through daily fast and sleepless night. For her, and those who share her lot, the gate of paradise I wot ne'er openeth. For the gospel says, they fast and make long prayers for praise of men, and thus they cast away God's kingdom at the dooming day. Poverty Last poverty of whom I vouch, no penny lay within her pouch, nor coat had she to sell for pelf and buy a rope to hang herself. Naked as any wretched worm, she oft in direful winter's term nigh dies with misery and cold. Nought else her body did enfold except a sack, from whence hung torn foul rags, for robe and mantle worn. Therewith alone did she dissemble her nakedness, her limbs a-tremble down in a corner on the ground, couched like a beaten shame-faced hound. Alas, a dolorous fate hath she cast out from all men's company. A curse the hour when man is born to live in poverty forlorn, far better had he never been than naked, houseless, friendless seen. Before these images I stayed some space, each one was well arrayed in dazzling gold and azure bright, by skilful limner deftly dight. The wall was high and built of hard rough stone close shut and strongly barred, enclosing round a garden vast, wherein no swain had ever passed. Beyond all doubt a place most fair, and I most gladly entry there had made, and plenteous measure he of thanks had won, who showed to me how, helped by steps or ladder tall, my feet might scale the high-built wall. O oh, joy of joys, O oh, dear delight, if twere but given to me that height to climb, and such sweet joyance win as surely might be found therein. This garden was a safe retreat for hosts of nesting birds, and sweet their piping sounded from the trees. The glory of the place, the breeze was redolent of woodland song, nor shall I be convict of wrong in saying that it shields perchance three times as many birds as France contains elsewhere. The harmony thereof could scarcely fail to be such as would cheer the saddest wight, and wake his soul to sweet delight. To me more boundless was the pleasure to hear those songs than words may measure, and fain had I an hundred pounds paid straight to win within the bounds, and see the gathered cloud of these sweet birds God save them in the trees, and list their tireless minstrelsy, which e'en loves dancing tunes out by all piping clear from untaught throats, in ever-varying wilding notes. While hearkening to the matin chant the small fowl sang, my soul a pant became with longing for some mode to win within this blessed abode, and searched but vainly searched, alas, for means or fair or foul to pass the wall but not to help me found. And then I vainly gazed around for one who might for love or mead 
within that longed-for haven lead my eager footsteps. Thus I stood with dire vexation well nigh would, until the thought possessed my mind that never yet was wall so blind that careful diligence should fail to find some door or means to scale. Hot foot the boundary's full extent I traversed, heart and soul intent some aperture to spy, at last mine eye with eager joy I cast upon a wicket, straight and small, worked in the stern forbidding wall, and forthwith set myself to get an entry there, whate'er might let. Here is described how idleness unto the dreamer gave ingress. Full many a time with sounding blow I struck the door, and head bent low stood hearkening who might make reply. The hornbeam wicket presently was opened by a dame of air most gracious and of beauty rare. Her flesh as tender chickens was, her blonde locks bright as bowl of brass. Radiant her brow, of arching due her eyebrows, and well spaced the two. Neither too small nor yet too great her nose, but straight and delicate. No falcon, I would boldly swear, hath eyes that could with hers compare. Her breath was sweet as breeze, time fed, her cheeks commingled white and red, her mouth a rosebud and her chin well rounded with a sweet cleft therein. Her tower-like neck of measure meet, the purest lily well might beat for fairness, free of spot or whem. Twixt this and far Jerusalem, I trow, were found none other such, so fair to sight, so soft to touch. Her bosom would outshine the snow new fallen, ere it soiled of show, and all her body formed and knit so well as naught might equal it. Much doubt I, if since time had birth, a fairer dame had trod dull earth. A chaplet on her brow was set of orphreys, never maiden yet more lovesome looked, and though my days I spent to sing her beauty's praise, twere done but insufficiently. A graceful silken robe wore she, and on her head a garland bare of roses, which the Orphrey's fair surmounted. In her gentle hand she grasped a mirror, and a grand quaint carven comb her tresses held, while gloves of spotless white repelled the sun, which fain would kiss her skin. And lastly she had tired her in a costly coat of cloth of ghent, on which much labour had been spent embroidering, while her sleeves around with silken cords were laced and bound. And when that she her raiment fair had donned, and tired her golden hair, the day for her was worn and done, naught else had she to think upon. A joyful time, a pleasant May was hers, for care she drove away and dreamed of nothing, night and morn, but how her body to adorn. When thus I saw the garden gate unlocked by this most delicate and winsome dame, her goodly head abashed me, and I gently said my thanks, and dared to ask her name, and who she was and whence she came. With pleasant mien, in no wise high or haughty, made she quick reply. My dear companions well express my name, who call me idleness. A rich and puissant woman I, passing the time right gleefully. Nought else have I to think upon, save what fair raiment I shall don, what rich and costly jewels wear, how deck my head, and tire my hair. When this is finished, then my day is ended, and to mirth and play I give myself. My dearest friend is mirth, and by his side I spend long pleasant hours. The Lord is he of this fair garden. Every tree from out the land of Saracens he brought, for well the art he kens to make his garden a delight. And as the trees grew strong, he dight the wall around, and caused thereon those dreadsome paintings to be done, of sorrow, hatred, eld, and spleen, which wending hither thou hast seen. He cometh here full oft to seek the pleasant leafy shade, and eke his followers join him in these bowers, mid mirth and joy to spend long hours untouched by care. E'en now I wot mirth lounging in cool shade or grot, listeth the sweet-voiced nightingale, Merle, Laverlock, Mavis, and Wood Whale. Here with his friends the long day through sweet solace finds he, for ne'er knew the world a place that would suffice like this for loss of paradise. No merrier folk were ever seen through earth's broad borders as I ween than those whom mirth doth hither bring to spend bright days in revelling. When thus this winsome dame had sped her tale, which I had hearkened with right good will, Dame Idleness, I cried, words fail me to express what great delight were mine to see Sir Mirth and all his company of joyous folk assembled here, so pleasant blithe and frank of cheer, nor would I tear myself away therefrom throughout the live-long day, 
for doubt I not they all will be fulfilled of gentle courtesy. No more I spake but thanked kind fate when idleness the garden gate threw open wide and unafraid to that sweet spot quick entry made. Then burst on my astonished eyes a dream, an earthly paradise, and suddenly my soul seemed riven from earth to dwell in highest heaven. Yet doubt I if heaven can give a place where I so soon would live as this sweet garden, sacred haunt of birds whose soft melodious chaunt ravished mine ears. The nightingales here sang, and there the green wood wails. The bullfinch piped beneath, above I heard the crooning turtle dove. Nearby the sweet-voiced tiny wren, while high in air beyond my ken the skylark soared, the titmouse shrilled, the fauvet's gentle treble trilled. The merle and mavis seemed to shake the leaves in cadence, while each break with small fowl rang as they would try their throats in choral rivalry. T'would seem as all and each of these sweet birds sang joyance to the breeze, and then their hearts disburdened, flew to keep some loving rendezvous. The sweet melodious harmony that winged its way from tree to tree with such soft symphony did fall as concert twere celestial. For never yet hath mortal ear been tuned such heaven-like songs to hear, and past all thought it seemed that earth could give such glorious music birth. Then all at once it broke on me, I heard the sirens of the sea, for they alone I trow can bring to ears such caroling. I vow that when beneath the shade the birds such glorious music made, my spirit and soul were like to melt and fail with that delight I felt, for ne'er ere this my whole life through did joy so unalloyed bedew my every sense, and ecstasy ran through the very soul of me. Bethought I then what untold debt I owed Dame Idleness, who set my feet in this surpassing place, for twas alone through her good grace and kindliness I entrance gained to this fair haunt, where mirth reigned supreme. My best and truest friend I'll counter till my life day's end. Now will I set myself to tell the further tale of what befell in that fair spot. What things Mirth did, and who the friends were that he bid to keep him company, will I declare all faithfully, and try to show and picture forth to you what happed to me in order due. Set out the hole in little space could no man, but if kindly grace you grant me, then shall be unrolled the tale complete till all be told. Within this garden past compare, the birds sweet voicing filled the air with honeyed songs and roundelays, discoursing in a thousand ways their tales of tender woodland love. I listed how some sang above my head, perched high among the leaves, and others mid the fragrant sheaves of blossom near the ground, and all with melody most musical. Rejoiced my heart exceedingly, then woke a new desire in me to look on mirth's fair countenance and grasp his hand, the radiance that flooded all my soul, I felt would be redoubled if he dealt me welcoming. I now forsook the open grassy space, and took a shaded pathway where my feet bruised mint and fennel savouring sweet, and following close my gracious guide, found me ere long within a wide secluded lawn, a sweet resort where mirth held joyously high court, in care spurned ease for full enjoyment of life's glad gifts. Undashed by cloyment of surfeit or revolt, Amazed I stood a while, mine eyes dazzled, for erst or since, ne'er men I ween so like winged angels eyes have seen. Herein the lover tells of gladness, a dame is she who casting sadness to the wild winds, doth not but play and carol through the livelong day. E'en as I came within the close, a glorious burst of song uprose for one whose name was Gladness, loud and clear-voiced sang amid the crowd foregathered there. Full well she knew to modulate her tones with due and gentle cadence, now to fall and now to rise high over all. Her note was clear as silver bell, and gently swaying rose and fell her supple form, the while her feet kept measured time with perfect beat. Mid her companions ever first her voice was into song to burst, for in that art divine did she exceed all rivals facilely. Then through my frame I felt a throw of joy to see them dancing go, as man and maid in measure trod with twinkling feet the springing sod. While minstrels sang, the tambourine kept with the flute due time I ween, and rondelettes burst forth amain to merry tunes of old Lorraine so sweetly that I doubt if e'er was heard such music otherwhere, for that fair province doth excel in heaven-born music's tuneful spell. 
Then saw I cunning jugglers play, and girls cast tambourines away aloft in air, then gaily trip beneath them and on fingertip catch them again with skill so rare that all men stood a-wondering there. Then came two damsels tired with taste that Venus' self had not disgraced, and suited well their dainty dresses, the wondrous plates that bound their tresses, their kirtles thin but reached the knee, through which their forms showed pleasantly. I saw the twain toward mirth advance with agile leap and darting glance, then both flew forward with a bound, just missed a kiss, then flung them round as though they feared some wrong they'd done, then lovingly embraced anon, then once more did they retreat, a-playing with their winsome feet a thousand antic turns. So quaint and strange they were, that I should paint their wonders feebly did I try to show the supple subtlety with which their lithe light bodies swayed. Such tumult in my breast it made, as never dance and song I deem had done before, in sooth or dream. Here in the dreamer's pen doth draw the semblance of the dance he saw, and joined in, and relates how she, height courtesy, essays to be his guide, and gently tells him who dance there, and all they say and do. I stood a while as one entranced to watch how wondrously they danced, till tripped across the sward to me a winsome dame, height courtesy. Past power of words I found her fair, bewitching bright and debonair, May God preserve her life from harm. At once with voice that seemed to charm all fear away, she cried, Fair sir, wilt thou not deign thy foot to stir and jocund dance? Without delay I followed where she led the way with right good will, for strong desire to join the throng my heart gan fire. Yet scarce therewith to mingle dared, till thus her welcome speech had bared my mind of doubt. I then began the glorious folk around to scan, their fashions, manners, style and seeming, now list, while forth I tell my deeming. Erect Sir Mirth stood, straight and tall, in all points such as one might call a man well built. A tinge of red his white cheek lit, no vermi thread his mouth, but full and round, his eyes steel blue and gracious, whence did rise sweet smiles unceasingly. His nose was such as Grecian Phidias chose for great Apollo, blonde his hair, which fell adown his shoulders bare in silken curls, his girdle stead was slight, yet lithesome lusty head its lines betrayed, while arms and knees were knit like mighty Hercules. The glorious masterpiece did he of some great painter look to be, and scarce need fear comparison for beauty with Jove's godlike son. Where beard would be began to spring down, soft as that neath Cushat's wing. His noble limbs were richly clad in samite, which about it had figures of beauteous birds enwrought in golden tissue. Quaint past thought the slashings were with which t'was slit and puffed in every part of it, for fashion's sake, and gaily decked with jewels, naught of cost he wrecked. About his shapely legs and feet were boots carved curiously. Oh, sweet the roses were that well bested for crown his goodly golden head, there set by gentle hands of her who was his love and worshipper. And would ye wot who this might be whose love enthralled him? Soothfastly t'was gladness who so blithely sang. When she but seven years knew, love flang his net around her, and I ween since then mirth's sweetheart had she been. Then straightway did the pair enlace their hands and heart to heart embrace, joining in gladsome dance. Most fair did gladness look as stood they there, like to a rose, but newly blown, which naught of wind or storm hath known. So tender was her flesh that torn t'would be by frailest sapful thorn. Beneath her forehead, void of frown, were eyebrows arched of sunny brown, and smiles would wreathe her eyes before her mouth the rippling laughter bore, and ever and anon the bliss her lips invited of a kiss. Her nose of delicate form and white as well might show in wax despite. Oh, brilliant was the sun-gold hair that crowned her head, round which she wear a fillet fine, its wealth to hold o'er which a chaplet worked with gold rolled royally. Two score and nine fair orfrey chaplets neath mine eyne have passed ere while, but none were wrought of silk so well as this, methought. Her outer mantle was a rich bright robe of silken samite, which, seeing that mirth well loved it, she arrayed her in delightedly. The dreamer hear ye now declare what guise the god of love doth bear. Hard by this winsome pair did stand the god of love, whose mighty hand dealeth to lovers weal or woe, as seemeth good to him. Allow he casteth pride, 
and oft times makes high-minded men for ladies' sakes right humble, and proud dames to bow with meekness neath his yoke, I trow. The god of love is dowered with grace so richly, both in form and face, that scarce I deem of his allure my pen dare draw the portraiture. Love's friends had woven from his bowers, in scorn of silk, a robe of flowers, all worked about with amorettes and tied with dainty bandolettes, bedecked with lozenges and scutcheons, leopards, strange outland beasts and lions, while blossoms of all colours were besprinkled o'er it here and there. T'were no light task some flower to name that was not found thereon, each came to lend its beauty, blue periwinkle twixt rose and yellow broom did twinkle, with violets, pansies, bird's eye blue, and flowers untold of varied hue, sweet-scented roses, red and pale, round which flew many a nightingale, festooned love's head, and every sort of bird seemed there to hold high court. The skylark, blue tit, merle and dove, sang in his ear sweet songs of love, fluttering around his head, and he, one of God's angels, looked to be. Anigh him stood sweet looks, who glanced with soft regard on those who danced. A friend right well beloved was he of Cupid, and, bent readily for use, a crooked Turk's bow he bore in either hand. The first one wore most evil aspect, made of tree whose fruit I trow would nowise be of grateful savour, gnarled and hoar it was, and black as sun-scorched moor. The second pliant, lithe and white, with quaint designs and figures dight of dames and knights of gentle mien. Moreover, in his hands were seen ten arrows, five of which were fair and beauteous. These his right hand bare, brilliant the plumes, the notches made of gold, the while like precious blade each shaft end wore. Though naught of steel or iron knew they, hearts would feel their wound stroke sorely. Save the shaft and plumes, t'was well-skilled goldsmith's craft had wrought these weapons. They were capped with cruel barbs, and whoso happed within their murderous range to fall, would feel love's wound and own his thrall. Of these five shafts I trow the best and speediest when it knew love's hest, and fairest eke for plumage reckoned, had beauty for its name. The second was called Simplicity, the third was Franchise, and another word bedecked it, Sweetest Courtesy. Companionship I saw to be the fourth, which if twere shot from far would do small harm, but greatly mar if drawn an ear. The fifth and last fair seeming was, which deftly cast doth sorely maim, but yet the wound incurable is rarely found, but given due time may heal it be by means of love's sweet surgery. Sweet Luke's five arrows held likewise within his left hand, but of guise far different, formed of iron fell, and black as he who rules dark hell. The first was called unlovely pride, and villainy lay hard beside, with felony is he attaint. Portray the one, and both you paint. The third was shame, of downcast air, the fourth her fellow, dire despair, the while the last one proved to be new thought, or infidelity. These shafts whose qualities I name a close relationship may claim and all moreover plainly show near kin with that most hideous bow, all knotted, gnarled, deformed and rough, though soothly seemed it good enough to launch such villain shafts, which strive in all things gainst the fair maid five whereof I've told. O oh, scarce will you their power and force give credence to, but yet the simple truth shall be hereafter plainly told by me, and have a care lest you forget the drift and sense of what is set before your eyes by this plain tale, for you shall find no small avail therein ere yet the end is sped, fair wit with wisdom closely wed. Beauty. Now turn I to my tale amain, and will of all love's frolic train declare at full the countenances, their joyous sports and graceful dances. Perceived I that the god of love one noble lady sought above all others gathered there, she hight Dame Beauty, as that arrow bright which bore her name was she, and dowed with gentle grace which freely showed in all her movements. As the moon makes candles of the stars, her noon paled all her fellows. As the dew her flesh was tender, and ne'er new and blushing bride more simple seemed, Where'er her skin peeped forth it gleamed as white as fleur de lis, her brow was clear and fair as virgin snow, the while her form was tall and slight. No need had she her face to dight with paint or other vain disguise, as women some whiles use. Despise and scorn might she such false allure in nature's decking bright and pure. 
So plenteous grew her golden hair, that near her heels it reached, I swear. Her nose, her mouth, her beaming eyes, were such that when their beauties rise, God help me, in my thought they seem to wake once more that glorious dream. Forsooth, so sweet she was and fair, with perfect rounded limbs, that ne'er throughout the world's broad space I ween, aught could surpass her matchless sheen. Here tells the dreamer of richesse, who counteth her of high noblesse, but so consumed is she with pride, that all poor men she casts aside, and therefore less beloved by far than those who sweet and courteous are. Dame Richesse stood by beauty's side, haughty of mien and puffed with pride, rude arrogance and self-esteem. Right rash and hardy should I deem the man who hindrance dared to throw across her path, for well doth know Richesse her foes to spoil and spill, but honours those who do her will. Neither today nor yesterday t'was learned that rich folk have their way, and oftentimes misuse their power to raise men up in one short hour to great estate, or make them fall to misery dire. Both great and small to Dame Richesse full deference give, for neath her rule men love to live, and serving her will gladly die, proud to have worn her livery, yet not because they hold her dear and love her, but for craven fear. Mockers and flatterers much abound within her courts, and there are found traitors and envious folk who try to do those good men injury whose worth deserveth laud and praise. Chiefest among their devious ways is this, with false oiled tongue to speak for men on whom they long to wreak their vengeance, but their poisonous clacks sound loudly when they turn their backs, for noblest men would they abase, to miscreants giving power and place disloyal, they all loyalty treat with contempt and scorn, but vie in persecuting good men, while they laud the vilest of the vile, and many an upright man one sees forth driven from courts by perfidies. But may these envious flatterers be by God brought down to misery. Alas, that ere such folk were born, their ways and works all good men scorn. A purple robe did Richesse wear, than which for heaven and earth I swear, fearless to be convict of lie, none e'er was wrought more daintily. The purple broidered with great store of orphreys, rich with golden ore, with forms of mighty men it shone, renowned in ages past and gone, great dukes and kings and such as be, writ large in ancient history. The golden band around her neck did many an orled shield bedeck, silver on ruddy gold annealed illumined each bright quartered shield, the whole inwrought most craftily, and great of price I warrant ye. Then o'er her robe and round each hem shone many a lustrous priceless gem, which flashed and glittered in the light as heaven's bright stars on frost-clear night. Richesse around her girdle-stead was glorious wise encinctured above her purple robe. A stone of magic power and virtue shone amidst thereof. The white who bore this stone need poison's fear no more, for gainst all venoms which to man bear danger t'was a talisman, and to a knight of gentle birth above Rome's treasures was its worth. The mordant of a gem was made that aching of the teeth allayed, and whoso looked on it ere yet he break his morning's fast should get long years of faultless sight. Of gold without alloy was made the hold that clasped it, while each single tooth was worth a besant's weight forsooth. No silk or satin plaits she wear to hold her wealth of yellow hair, but golden circlets thrice refined the glory of her head confined. A subtle pen that scribe would own who could at full describe each stone and gem unvalued, richly set within her gorgeous coronet. For not a man on earth can guess their untold worth and pricelessness. Sky-shaming sapphires, rubies red as pigeon's blood but newly shed, garnets and emeralds weighed not less than ounces ten, but profitless it were that I should strive to paint the great carbuncle's glory. Faint and poor were any words of mine to warrant how tis wont to shine so clearly that on murkiest night devoid of lamp the wearer might so strongly shoots its brilliant ray, for many a league pursue his way. Such brightness sprang from forth this stone that every part of Richesse shone with glory, body, feet and face, as though bright stars belit the place. Fast by the hand Dame Richesse led a youth of fairest goodly head, her gallant past all doubt was he, and gladly sought her company. He loved fine mansions, castles fair, and jewels rich and vestments rare. 
Grand stables, horses passed all price. And sooner were he charged with vice of theft or murder than twere said his stables harboured crock or jade. The friendship constantly he sought of Dame Richesse, for all his thought was how to scatter wealth, and she supplied his hands ungrudgingly. Right recklessly he made display of gorgeous splendour day by day, while she with free hand gave as though gold bezants did her barns o'erflow. Largesse. Then next to noble Richesse came Largesse, a free and generous dame. No man on earth, I trow, doth live, loves more to grasp than she to give honour and wealth. To Alexander is she akin, and loves to squander her gifts if but for giving's sake, crying to all who pass, Come, take. Poor pinching avarice loves not more to heap and gather needless store than largesse doth to scatter wide her good, and still doth God provide her plenteous wise, for while tis spent thus freely, still doth it augment. Largesse I keepeth neath her rule, alike the sage and drivelling fool. All bow to her, and fain confess her for their friend and patroness. And if perchance she suffereth hate of any wight, tis dissipate quick as hoar-frost by some great gift, and therefore rich and poor uplift loud voice alike in largesse praise. A fool is that great lord whose ways are beggar-like. No other vice degrades great men like avarice. The man of close, hard, griping hand ne'er wins high seigneury or land, for few finds he of loving friends to spread his fame or work his ends. The man who fain would draw around him friends should let his hand abound in gifts free given, for thus he earns great love, and as the needle turns towards the pole, e'en so shall he by gifts draw friends abundantly. A purple garment rich and cool and woven in the Momet school of Saracens did largesse wear, left open t'was with careless care about the neck, for latterly unto a dame hard by her she had lent the mordant, passing well I liked the fashion, made to tell the snowy whiteness of her throat, which through thin gauze rapt eyes might note. For night Dame Largesse did engage a youth who claimed the lineage of Arthur, King of England. He bore valour's banner gloriously, and eke the gonfanon, right great and noble deeds by him relate minstrels, in courts of counts and kings, and hitherward he a trophy brings fresh from a tourney which he lays before his mistress' feet, whose praise through many a joust hath he maintained in shattering helm and shield, and gained proud victory over many a knight by virtue's power and strong-armed might. Franchise Franchise stood next on largesse right, of skin as delicate, pure and white as hawthorn bloom or june-tide rose, not of the Orleans twist her nose, but well-formed long and straight, her brow bore eyebrows arched like Cupid's bow or laughing eyes, her long locks blonde, her mien as simple, sweet and fond as turtle dove. Her tender heart rejoiced in joy or bore its part with others' sadness, and was fain to keep her lips when speech woke pain. So piteous was she and so true, she ne'er would suffer one to rue his life for love of her, Nay more such sympathy towards all she bore that when she saw some man who sighed for her, she hastened to his side to save his soul from misery dire. Of finest woof was her attire, and warrant I that never lass betwixt this place and far arras wear daintier raiment. It was sewed and broidered in such skilful mode that doubt I much could see more point have been more skilfully adjoint. Grateful and charming to the eye was franchise modest bravery for nothing ever suits so well as simple frock for demoiselle, and that in which franchise was dight, linen of pure and spotless white by dyes unstained, did well express the maiden's inward loveliness. Beside franchise a stripling stood of noble port and lustihood, but how he named him knew I not, yet one so fair of me and I wot, and gaily clad as bird in spring, were well the son of Windsor's king. Herein the author's pen essays to show why courtesy the praise deserves of all men. Love she spreads around her wheresoe'er she treads. And next stood gracious courtesy, who ne'er midst men can fail to be welcome. Strangers to her are pride and folly. Straightway to her side she summoned me with kindly call to join the gladsome dance with all. Frank-eyed she was, and no deal shy or timid, but most graciously spake forth to me in friendly wise with pleasant words and quaint replies, wherein one found no poison lurk. Her form was nature's perfect work, 
and e'en as stars like candles mean beside the moon's bright rays are seen, so her companions showed beside her dazzling beauty's winsome pride. Than this fair damsel who shall find a nobler face or gentler mind, or one who would more worship gain should she as queen or empress reign. Beside her stood a valiant knight, who knew to choose his words aright whene'er he spake. Well loved seemed he of her who bare him company, well skilled in feats of arms, his grace showed forth alike in form and face. Then idleness came near to me, whose hand I took most willingly to join the dance. Ere while I've said how fraught with grace and goodly head she was, and she twas raised the pin that kept the wicket, and within the close through her I entrance gained, my trembling heart set free and feigned. And lastly here is told of youth, reckless naive and wild forsooth, the last that lingers in my mind is youth, to all but pleasure blind. No more than twelve short years I ween this innocent maiden yet had seen of good or ill, and looked to be still in her first simplicity. Of naught she dreamed from day to day but gladness, joy, and gleesome play, and only mirth and laughter sought, without one care or afterthought. A lover had she, like in age to her sweet self, and no more sage than she, the simple pair would kiss from time to time, and naught amiss they deemed it all the dance should see when they embraced as lovingly as cooing turtle doves. The boy, e'en as the girl, was no wise coy, but was, in artlessness for her, a fitting mate, I dare aver. Thus merrily this jovial throng disported them with dance and song, and many another knight and dame of gracious mien and goodly fame soon joined them to the light heart crew, while through the air gay laughter flew. The god of love with care doth watch the lover's steps, in hope to catch him unawares, and so the five bright arrows through his heart to drive. When dance and dancers I had seen to heart's content, across the green I turned to wonder at mine ease. Beneath the burgeoning mulberry trees, laurels, lithe hazels, and dark pines, throughout the garden's far confines. And when the swaying dance was ended, and arms entwined the partners wended to seek soft couches neath the shade that long lawn kissing branches made. Lord God, such jolly lives they led as all must envy, by my head who are not fools, for naught I ween is better than with one dear queen to pass soft hours in tender love. What more gives paradise above? But straightway from the dance I went, and o'er the lawn my footsteps bent as fancy led, when suddenly the god of love who followed me signed to sweet looks to bring his bow and shafts that longed thereto, and lo, without a word he claimed from him the weapon fair, choosing the trim and beauteous arrows from the ten he held to serve his use, and then picked out the mighty god from thence one of swift flight and great potence, and, bow in hand, pursued me straight unseen. Oh God, how nearly fate o'ertook me then! But, unaware of love's intent, I wondered where green alleys led, the while that he, where so I sped, still followed me. No thought had I to stay or rest, but roved north, south, and east and west, desiring leisurely to view the close, and all that longed thereto. I noted that from side to side the garden was nigh broad as wide, and every angle duly squared. The careful planter had not spared to set of every kind of tree that beareth fruit some two or three, or more perchance, except some few of evil sort. Among them grew pomegranates, filled with seeds and thick of skin, most wholesome for the sick. Strange nut trees, which in season bore rich fragrant nutmegs, good for store, and nowise cursed with nauseous taste, but savouring well. Nearby were placed almonds and gillyflower cloves, brought hither from hot inns far groves. Dates, figs, and licorice, which deals contentment while misease it heals and wholesome aniseeds sweet spice, and much prized grains of paradise. Nor must rare cinnamon be forgot, nor zedory, which I wot at end of great repasts men eat, in hope twill bring digestion meat. Moreover in this garden rare grew many a tree familiar, as cherry, pear, and knotted quince, neath which a tender tooth will wince. Brown meddlers, plums, both black and white, apples and chestnuts, peaches bright, Sorb apples, barberries, fruit of lote, and many more of lesser note. And all around this pleasant close, holly and laurel and home arose with yew and hornbeam. 
Fit I trow for flitting shaft and speeding bow, The cypress sad and pines that sigh To soft south breezes mournfully, Beech loved of squirrels, olive dark, And graceful birch with silvery bark, The shimmering aspen, maple tall, And lofty ash that top the wall, The limber hazel, oak trees hoar, But wherefore should I tell of more, For wearied would your heart be ere I numbered half that flourished there. But this I say, such skilful art had planned the trees that each apart six fathoms stood, yet like a net the interlacing branches met, through which no scorching rays could pass to sear the sward, and thus the grass kept ever tender, fresh and green, beneath their cool and friendly screen. Roebuck and deer strayed up and down the mead, and troops of squirrels brown the tree boles scoured, while conies grey shot merrily in jocund play around their burrows on the fresh and fragrant greensward void of mesh. Within the glades sprang fountains clear, no frog or newt ne'er came anear their waters, but neath cooling shade they gently sworded. Mirth had made therefrom small channeled brooks to fling their waves with pleasant murmuring in tiny tides. Bright green and lush around these sparkling streams did push the sweetest grass. There might one lie beside one's love luxuriously, as though twere bed of down. The earth, made pregnant by the streams, gave birth to thymy herbage and gay flowers. And when drear winter frowns and lowers in spots less genial, ever here things bud and burgeon through the year. The violet sweet of scent and hue, the periwinkle's star of blue, the golden kingcups burnished bright, mingled with pink-rimmed daisies white, and varied flowers, blue, gold, and red, the alleys, lawns, and groves o'erspread as they by nature's craft had been enamelled deftly on the green, and all around, where'er I went, fresh blooms cast forth sweet, odorous scent. Small need there is to fabulate more fully of the fair estate of this most comely garden, lest it wear your patience. Not expressed could all the glorious beauty be of this most wondrous place by me, and therefore stay from words increase thereon, and henceforth hold my peace. Yet willing to explore each nook and secret spot, my way I took, hither and thither, left and right. The god of love still kept in sight my every movement, even as he who tracks a quarry carefully, seeks for the moment when his prey doth unawares his life betray. So wandering o'er this charmed ground, I lastly came to where I found a fountain neath a glorious pine, Ne'er since great Charles of Pepin's line was born, hath mortal eye e'er seen, in any garden as I ween, a pine so tall, straight grown and fair, and in a stone of marble rare, had nature's hand most deftly made a fountain neath that pine tree's shade. And gazing on the side of it, beheld I small clear letters writ, which said, Here fair Narcissus lay and died, in tears dissolved away. The author here of Fair Narcisse doth tell the tale, who was, a wis, drawn on to love his proper shade, seen in a well and therefore made his life so wretched that at last he pined and wasted till he passed to nothingness. His soul doth sit beside the fount and dream of it. Narcissus hight a youth beset by love and snared within his net who thereby so great sufferance felt as lastly caused his soul to melt in tears and render up the ghost. For him, fair Echo's soul was lost in love that reason's voice defied, and she, o'ercome with passion, cried, O oh, shouldest thou disdain to give to me thy love, I scorn to live. Then he, self-loving fool and vain of heart, regarded not her pain, but scoffed at every fond caress and spurned her proffered tenderness, until, despairing day by day, she wasted, pined, and waned away for love of him. But as in air her spirit passed, she made her prayer to God, that this Narcissus hard, unpitying heart might e'en be scarred like hers, with love unsatisfied, to recompense his cruel pride. And thus at last he too might prove the pangs of unrequited love. The God in pity bowed his ear to list his sweet petitioner, and caused Narcissus, tired and worn with hunting, through a summer's morn o'er valley, lawn, and mountain's crown, hither to come and cast him down, consumed by thirst, beside the cool and crystal waters of the pool to which the spreading pine tree gave refreshing shade. 
Then o'er its wave he bent him, driven by thirst to drink that limpid wave that lapped its brink. This telleth how Narcissus sighed his soul away in tearful tide through fond self-love. Yet died he not, but lives within this fount, I wot. When stooped he low to slake his druth and saw his forehead, nose and mouth, he started back in wonderment, for through his heart the vision sent a thrill to see himself so fair, matchless in form of beauty rare. Then love knew well his way to take Narcissus in his toils, and make him suffer such like cruel woe as he had dealt to fair echo. Beside the crystal fount he lay, gazing enwrapped the live-long day, enamoured of the shadow he saw in the fount so perfectly, until he sighed away his breath, and lastly found thereby sweet death. Now hearken while the tale I tell how on his heart love's vengeance fell, when plain it was that he no wise could gain that thing which in his eyes alone seemed good, and when he knew how hopeless all his longing grew of sweet fulfilment, and that ne'er could he in that he longed for share and have his joyance, then he lost in wrath his reason, and the frost of death came o'er him. Thus was heard the prayer of that sweet nymph whose word of love he rudely scorned. O fair and gentle ladies, be ye ware by this example that your ears ye shut not hardily, nor tears despised of those who seek your love, lest ye with vain remorse should prove how God doth punish those who leave kind swains to die, or vainly grieve. Assured the fair inscription writ above the fountain pointed it most plainly for the selfsame one whereby Narcisse had been foredone, my impulse was towards speedy flight, without one glance within the bright but treacherous wave. The very thought of sad Narcissus dooming brought fear to my heart. But soon I said, Whereof, O man, art thou afraid? Twere madness didst thou not essay this fount wherein sweet sunbeams play. Forthwith then on my knees I sank, pressing the verdant mossy bank with wish more closely to behold the flood, and pebbles note, than gold more bright that freely paved the floor of that fair fount. Without the door of paradise the blest, I ween no sight more beauteous may be seen than this bright well. The gushing source springs ever fresh and sweet. Its course takes through runnels twain full deep and broadly trenched. It knows no sleep by day or night, for ne'er tis dried by wasting drought of summer tide. Nor hath stern winter's iron hand the power to make its waters stand immovable but out the ground its babble calls the whole year round. Close tender herbage which doth push unceasingly strong, thick and lush. Fast in the fountain's pavement shone two sparkling spheres of crystal stone, whereon my gaze with wonder fell, and when the tale thereof I tell, your ears will tingle as I trow, and pleasure unto marvel grow. When that the sun, which searcheth all the things that live on land, lets fall his rays within this fount, we see an hundred colours gorgeously shine forth within the water bright, vermilion, azure, silvery white, and richest gold. Such virtuous power these crystals have that every flower and tree within this pleasant scene reflection finds in their sweet sheen. How doth this hap most clearly I will by example testify. E'en as a mirror casteth back each thing that fronts it, nor doth lack in working thus to give a main the form and colour once again, so every crystal facet here reflects each detail sharp and clear of all that in this garden lies. For whosoever casts his eyes thereon, one half the garden sees, and if to turn his fancy please, the other half is then revealed. Nor are the smallest objects sealed or darkly hid, but all appear portrayed within those crystals clear. Mirrored within this perilous place, Narcissus loved too well his face and lustrous eyes with foolish pride, Thence came his fall, and thence he died. Alas for him who doth admire himself herein, for love's desire will seize his heart, and naught can heal his hopeless woe, nor aught anneal. This mirror valiant men hath cost dear life, though fairly might they boast themselves for prudent, wise, and great, they here, alas, have found their fate. Hence passion springs in man anew, and to this life gives fresh purview, no measure, sense, or mode knows he, Love, love alone hath mastery. Good counsel to the winds is cast, for Cupid, Venus' son, hath passed around the fount to sow the grain whereof all men are madly fain. The seed of love to wit, and set his springers there, and many a net for damsels fair and gallants eke, such birds alone doth Cupid seek. 
By reason of the seed there sown, this fountain is to all men known as that of love. Thereof is told the tale full oft in many an old romance and song, but ne'er before hath any man so fully or so truly set all forth as now tis writ within this book I trow. Beside the fount a while I stayed, admiring how the crystals made mirrors for all the lovesome things that filled the garden. Memory brings before me that too long I let their charms engross my mind. Ah, yet I feel these mirrors t'was deceived my soul, and could I have believed what sorrow to their sight was wed, then had I turned my steps and fled as flees a man the plague. Ah me, I fell, like others, woefully. O'er all things mirrored there I chose a rose-bush, charged with many a rose, encinctured by a thick brown hedge, and doubt ye not that though in pledge Paris and Pavia held I both, mine heart in no degree were loath to render up the twain, so I might gaze thereon unceasingly. Soon as I felt this passion seize my heart, which oft hath caused misease to wisest men, my longing drew me towards the rose-bush, and then flew through all my soul its savour sweet which set my heart and pulse a beat like fire. And were it not for fear that I the Scot might pay too dear, I surely should have dared to seize a rosebud seen naught else could please my senses equally. But dread restrained my hand, lest, angered thereat, the guardian of the spot might thrust me thence straightway, God wot. A heap were roses. None, I ween, elsewhere neath heaven blue dome hath seen such rich profusion, some as yet mere buds, which therefore ne'er had met rude Boreas' kiss, while others were half-opened, and such beauty rare displayed as no man would despise, who once thereon had cast his eyes. For roses which are broadly blown, ere long begin to cast adown their petals, while the tender new fresh buds, as yet untouched by dew, will keep their beauty while the sun his race through three full days doth run. What ardent longing in my breast these buds inspired, Whoso possessed the power to pluck but one, right fain must be such glorious prize to gain, and might I but secure a crown thereof, I would forego renown and fortune fair. Amongst them all my rapturous eyes on one did fall, whose perfect loveliness outvied all those beside it. I espied with joy its lovely petals, which kind nature's hand had dyed with rich deep crimson hue. Its perfect leaves were formed of two quadruple sheaves, which side by side stood firm and fair, with stalks strong grown enough to bear the full-grown bloom which did not bend or languish, but most sweetly spend its fragrance on the air around, and wrapped my senses in profound yet soft delight. Whene'er I smelt its odour, strong desire I felt possess me wholly that I might snatch for mine own that dear delight. But thorns and thistles grew so thick around the rose-bush, prone to prick and wound the profanous hand that dared approach and grasp it, that I spared to risk the rash attempt, afraid my love might be with wounds apaid.